Genesis 1, 2 is perfection. Genesis 3 is the fall. Okay. So why does God is you know why does God always take me back to Genesis? Every time he explains something to me, I don't care how many sermons he's talking to me about to tell you guys, it's always back to Genesis. It's always back to Genesis. There's so much in Genesis 1, 2, and 3 that he imparts to me. Um, well, when God created Adam, he knew that Adam needed community. So he created Eve. Okay. He created Eve. He gave him all living things to support him, and he gave a companion, Eve, from his rib. He told them to live together and multiply. In other words, to have community and have family. In Eden, it was perfection. Adam and Eve were supernatural. How do I know that? Because I told you guys many times they could actually see tree of knowledge of good and evil, knowledge, and they could actually see life, the tree of life. There are two trees in the middle of the garden. And we cannot see knowledge. We cannot see life. Okay? And you say, oh, no, no, I could see. Okay, if you Google life, you see people jumping. <laughs> That's not life. Can't see life. So I believe that Eve and Adam were supernatural. They could see things that they couldn't see. In fact, come on, in the garden, the snake spoke. It was all supernatural. The snake was talking to them. The snake, he says in Genesis 3, he didn't say snakes. Right? Pay attention when you read God's word. It says, now the serpent. He didn't say, now serpents. Now the serpent. So God's intention was to have pure fellowship and relationship with Adam and Eve and their offspring to come in the Garden of Eden. But nonetheless, God also knew because he can see the end from the beginning. He also knew that they were going to fall. That they were going to fall. Still, a true relationship has risk. Right? It has risk. Adam and Eve had free will. They had free will to choose. Okay? So God made one tree, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and told them not to eat from the fruits of it. The reason I believe God called out to Adam when he says, Adam, where are you when you eat from the tree? Was actually to give him a chance to repent. Our God is a God of second chances. God who is all-knowing, don't need to ask, where are you, Adam? Right? He knew exactly where Adam, he knew exactly what he had done. Okay? If you don't know how that happens, just look at Cain and Abel later on. And God said to Cain, what have you done? Your brother's blood is crying from the ground. So God's all knowing. So why did he ask Adam, Adam, where are you? Where are you, Adam? I believe that he wanted Adam to come and say, Hey, Father, I blew it. I blew it. Right? I blew it. But what happened? What happened? Instead of saying, I did it, Instead of being accountable, instead of being in control of himself, he did this. The woman you gave me told me to eat from it. She gave it to me. Blame Eve right away, right? He blamed Eve right away. That's the first thing he did. And then God goes to Eve. One thing repentance. Eve, what have you done? Eve could have said, I'm sorry. I do it. I am sorry. What did Eve do? The snake. Mm -hmm. She went and blamed the snake. Okay? The snake and so forth and so forth and so forth. And on and on and on. It snowballed. It snowballed. So why is why is this relevant to establishing a godly relationship, you may ask me. Why is it? See, if we see the sequence of events, the whole time God was asking questions after questions. You notice that? God didn't give command. Right away. He was asking Adam, Adam, where are you? And then he says, Oh, I'm here. I don't want, you know, I'm naked. He says, How did you know you're naked? Look at the question God is asking him. 
right? And then he goes, wow, I ate from the fruit. And he said, oh, why did you do that? Oh, well, the woman you gave me. And then ask the woman, why did you do that? Well, the snake, you, and the snake did it. God, the whole time, was asking questions. In fact, he put the tree in the middle of the garden and told them it's forbidden. It was his way of not making them agree, but to accept who they are. See, God didn't want them to make, make them agree to everything that he wants them to agree to. If God wanted to do that, he would have put that one single tree in the garden of Eden and say, don't eat it. Don't eat it. The moment he says, don't eat it, he just gave you a choice. If he doesn't want to give you a choice, he doesn't need to make that tree. Do you understand? You can just eat anything you want. No need for choice. Right? That means you have silently agreed to something. Somebody actually made you agree without you even knowing. But God's heart's not like that. He made that one tree. One tree is enough. Right? He doesn't need many. Remember I told you Gideon? God is all about quality, not about quantity. One tree is enough for you to make a choice, the right or the wrong choice. The right or the wrong choice. Right? So he wanted to know if they can make that choice. If we choose the wrong way, we would have chosen Satan's way. If they, we choose the right way, we would have chosen God's way. But in the story, in Genesis 3, we read that Adam and Eve blew it. They chose the wrong way. All right? They chose the wrong way. But even then, even when they chose the wrong way, God did something amazing. Right? God in Genesis 3, thank you, Angie, you read that, it says that even when we see God, immediately God went and clothed them with animal skin. Did you know that that was the first sacrifice? That was the first sacrifice. Nowhere else have you read to kill anyone. That was the first sacrifice. Done by whom? Done by God. For what? To cover their shame. To cover their shame. When they discovered shame, God killed those animals, took their skin and covered them. Covered them. Okay, remember this incident. See, when Adam and Eve fell, they lost their super and became natural. They were supernatural. They lost their super, take out their super, now natural. Okay? They were no longer supernatural, just natural. They stopped celebrating and started to compare. See, when you're supernatural, you don't need to compare. You just celebrate. You know, you just celebrate. You know, okay, today you went on a diet, you lost two pounds. I went on the same diet, I lost 10 pounds. Big deal. We just celebrate. There's no comparison. Maybe you never lost any weight, but you didn't gain any weight. Celebrate. Right? It's all about celebration when we are supernatural. When we fall into this body, thanks to Adam and Eve, we start to compare. We started to compare. Then we start to see Cain and Abel and how the sinful nature started to continue. From Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel were the first two kids. They started to fall. It's a generational curse that continued to go on. In fact, God cursed the snake and cursed the ground. And literally, literally, though Adam and Eve, you're going to suffer, you're going to you're gonna have a lot of pain given birth, and you, by the way, is going to like work like mad, and the ground's going to rebel against you with thistles and thorns. You read that. So the ground and the entire earth was cursed because of Adam. Adam wasn't just the only one cursed. The entire world, all of creation, was cursed because of one man's transgression. A choice to choose Satan over God. Okay? All of the earth is cursed. Do you know every grass, blade, every tree that you see outside my garden, they're waiting for the day for Jesus to come back. In the Bible, it says, all creation knows God. Wow. You know when I read that? I go, all creation knows God? How come?
Anfang Muido. All creation. Even dogs, my dogs. Right? Your mom said, come on here. They get Why? Because we have dominion. They see that. They don't question. They don't question. You know, animals, they don't just simply bite unless they're threatened. Right? We make up all kinds of crazy ideas on how you gotta shoot the bear, you gotta shoot the shoot the crocodiles. If you don't go swim in their territory where they eat and they take care of their young, I don't think they're gonna bite you. I don't think the crocodile will crawl two miles to come and bite you. I don't think it's gonna happen. Because they all know God. Let me tell you something. So, Cain and Abel, sinful nature continued on. The curse was passed on. You see, Cain wanted to make God, listen to this, Cain wanted to make God agree to his offering. Cain wanted to make God agree to his offering. Why do I say that? Because you know, in the Bible, if you read that part by Cain and Abel, you know, you will find that Cain was a farmer. Okay? Abel was taking care of the flock, right? The animals. So, when God said, bring your first offering, Abel brought the best from his flock. The best. Cain harvested the crop and chose all the best and then just took the ones that he felt God would agree to receiving as an offering. See, God's heart is always about your first offering. Your first offering. Because if you look at God, He gave us His first and only offering, His Son. Do you know that? Who among us will give up your only child? To some stranger to die for them. Who? No. Okay. But God will always give His first offering to us. So I'm encouraging you guys to think about that and meditate on about first offering. And where is your heart? Where is your love? What, whatever it is, your first part in your heart, okay? To God. So we see that Abel. I mean, Cain was trying to make God agree to his offering. Whereas Abel came and gave his best to God and just waited to understand more of God's heart. That's all he wanted to do. He just wants to show up, get the best lamb, and go, okay, what's next, God? Like a child. What's next? What's next? Whereas Cain, no, I got it planned. Cain is like, I got it planned. You know, I got all these fruits, the best kind of fruits. I know I'll get through the winter, no problem. I'll just give God this, this, this half rotten ones. What did God do? God rejected it. God rejected it not because he was, you know, he wanted to, he just wanted again for him to repent. He wanted Cain to repent. But Cain took it so hard upon himself. That re- he felt that oh it's a huge rejection right he didn't agree to what I wanted him to agree to how do I make him agree I know his favorite I'll take him out he killed Abel he killed Abel his own brother in the fields he took him to the field and killed him Smash his head or something. See, we inherited this sinful nature even today from Adam and Eve. We are still living it today. Like it or not, you are living it. So, we often compare instead of celebrating. We look at somebody and say, Oh man, I need to drive a nice car. He must be the drug dealer. <laughs> you know, how come he can drive a Ferrari? Oh, this guy, look at him, drive a dilapidated car. He must think he must not have finished high school or something. Why? Eh? We're comparing. We're not celebrating. How do you know that guy that was driving the dilapidated car was walking before? Now he can travel further. Huh? How about the guy that was driving the Ferrari? Right? 
Maybe that's his way to do ministry. Like I often tell people, people jump in my car and say, why do you drive this car to East Hastings? Why not? Well, you know, they break into cars there and you drive a pretty nice car. I say, why not? I'm a son of the most high God. And if God wants me to have a nice car to do ministry, I'll take it. Thank you. Right? You, you shouldn't have to have false humility. False humility is that I cannot drive this car because some people might think I'm super rich and that's all I want to do is just show off and do ministry. No. Where's your heart? Where's your first fruit? Your first fruit is for God, right? If your first fruit is for God, God's always first fruit. He's going to pour down even more first fruit for you. Listen, you drive a Bima, next day you're going to drive a Ferrari to do ministry. He wants you to travel a little faster. He knows that. So just tell me, don't feel this false humility. Okay, I have to look really bad to go to church so that everybody thinks that I'm, 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 I'm really good. You know, I'm just... Come on. You think in heaven you want to look really bad? Excuse me? The road in heaven, it says in the book of Revelation, made out of translucent gold. The gold is so pure, it's, it's actually clear gold. That's dirt in heaven. Here yeah, we are wearing some earring made out of gold, we feel so proud of ourselves. Come on, go to heaven and say, hey, throw away your earring. <laughs> what? Yeah, throw away your watch. You don't need that. I'm just joking. Anyways. So we inherited this sinful nature. We compare. And we feel superior. When we feel superior, we often end up judging. Right? When we feel superior, we end up judging. Welcome, Gary. When we feel superior, we end up judging. When we feel inferior, we often feeling judge. We end up feeling judge. Can you find that? By the way, that's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You see, when Adam and Eve plant to the tree of knowledge of good and evil, they, they knew good and they knew evil. They knew what is superior and what is inferior. Before that, they didn't know. They did not compare. So this comparison leads to three types of broken behavior. And number one, you become a bully when you feel superior. You bully. I'm better than you. You know, at work, I know more. I'm the IT guy. Okay? You know nothing about computer. So you listen to me. You do this according to how I want you to do it. How often do you hear that at work? Right? You hear that at work. In nursing, I'm sure it says, do it this way. Put this IV in this way. This is the right way. I know because I'm in, I've been in here 20 years. You just graduated. In fact, you haven't even graduated yet. So you listen to me. <laughs> that happens, right? That happens. A bully, right? And the next one, the second type of broken behavior that comes out of this brokenness is a victim when we feel inferior. Now, how many of us always feel that way? See, reverse the role. Now the guy, the bully, the nurse is telling you, yeah, yeah, yeah. and then if you don't know any better, you feel like a victim. Then you go into your victim behavior. And then you go to your friends and you go, you know, the Angie girl or whatever her name is, Agnes or whatever, man, she's always telling me this, I feel so bad. And then your friend goes, oh, I'm so sorry for you. Oh, you shouldn't have to endure that. And then more, more victim behavior starts to manifest. Why? Because that inferiority is buried in the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The root of it is condemnation. You feel shame. Remember? I said, if you feel inferior, you often end up feeling touched. You feel shame. Shame. The third one is the rescuer, I call it. We feel some, if someone else is falling, like your friend, they're like, oh man, we gotta do something. You know, she's needing to do this. Guys, please help. I got this. Guys, help me. I gotta do this. Oh, I got I got in trouble again here. Help me. Alright? And there will be one of us that's gonna play rescuer. He's gonna play rescuer. Let me tell you something. That's another wrong behavior. Okay? Wrong behavior. 
either someone is falling into superiority or inferiority, some people may want to be the rescuer. Some people may see, let's say, somebody is becoming a bully. They say, well, i got to do something about it. I better go rescue that bully. He's going to get himself in trouble if he continues to be a bully like that. Oh, that person is always being victim. I better go shake her up and tell her to get off her, you know, her victim mentality and do something about it. That's a rescuer. How many of us have felt like that? You know, many. When you be honest with yourself, you feel like, oh man, I gotta do something about it. I gotta do. I gotta help my friend. In Second Timothy, you know why? We go back to the Bible and see what the Bible says. Okay, in Second Timothy one seven, the Scripture says like this in the New King James Version. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. I often preach from this verse. I don't care what sermon I'm telling you, I'm preaching from this verse. If you don't have any verse that you can remember, remember this one. 2 Timothy 1 7. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. Three things. Sound mind is self control. Self control. Okay? So the last week I told you that the enemy operates in the opposite direction of what God teaches us. The enemy knows how to read the Bible. Okay? That's the enemy that I know. He came from heaven. He was kicked out of heaven. He came from heaven. He saw. Whoa, good stuff. He got kicked out. Okay? So, he will work in the opposite direction of what God teaches us. So, the opposite of power is no power. Right? Opposite of power is no power. Powerlessness. No power. So if I'm the enemy, I got thinking, God's word is power. He says, give them power. Hmm, let me see how I can make them powerless. Powerless. When we operate in the flesh and comparing, we tend to try to make people agree to us. Okay? When we become an Adam and Eve, when we inherit this body, we start to compare. When we start to compare, it's like, man, i got to make them agree to what I want. Like, you know, that guy is always playing victim. I'm going to make her agree to stop being a victim. I'm going to make this guy agree to stop being a bully. Make them agree. We try to control others. Right? Well, here's the truth. It's powerlessness when you try to make people agree to what you want them to agree to. Okay? Every one of us, God has specially, carefully, wonderfully, fearfully made. After that, He threw away the mall and He says, a masterpiece. Another masterpiece. Another masterpiece. Every one of us is a masterpiece. Unique, special to God. So when you try to control others and make them into you, I think you're playing God. They're not you. They're special in the eyes of God. Okay? That's powerful.